talk show tonight is on Heineken, and we should have a lively discussion. Um, my name is Alan Kay, I run the Harm Reduction Commission in the United States, and I know from experience of when we put on Ibergain sessions at our conference, they've always been very packed, and we have a, um, a good crowd, and from experience also, there's a lot of interest from drug users as the effect and the impact of Ibergain once they use it. Let's, let's get on with this. We're going to start off with Howard Lotso. Microphone working, I guess it is. Uh, my presentation is on the history of the science uh, and politics and advocacy of Ibergain. And uh, science, uh, like every other uh, avenue of human endeavor, is uh, certainly uh, uh, has a political nature. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what Ibergain is. And uh, sorry for the poor Oh no, uh, Ibogain is found in the West African plant Tabernathi Boba. Uh, the, the alkaloids are principally uh, in, the alkaloids are principally uh, found in the bark of the root, and uh, the usable forms include uh, scraped or ground root bark, uh, as is used in uh, weedy, uh, uh religious ceremonies in uh, West Africa. There are also total alkaloid extracts that are used and uh, purified uh, chemical grades of ibogaine, and hopefully one day an approved and a regulated form of the drug. Uh, there's a considerable amount of data available on ibogaine from uh, the most simple chemical uh, information, such as this found in the Merck Index, and uh, this gives you a uh, uh, sort of a background where the uh, botanical source uh, used for hundreds of years in African medicine and religion, in, in uh, 1901, Ibogaine was isolated by, by Dybowski and Landrin. In 1958, its molecular structure was determined by Bartlett. In 1962, I discovered its anti-addictive effects. In 1991, the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the United States initi initiated the evaluation of Ibogaine. In 1993, the Food and Drug Administration approved a clinical study of Ibogaine. And in 1995, NIDA, National Center of Drug Abuse, held an important Ibogaine uh, uh, clinical review. Uh, Ibogaine uh, has been driven by the patents uh, because it allowed us to raise funds for development. And there were five patents in the area beginning in 1985 and proceeding through 1992. And these patents were for the treatment of narcotic dependence, cocaine and amphetamine dependence, uh, alcohol dependence, uh, nicotine and tobacco dependence, and polydrug dependence. Uh, this is a, a brief overview of important points in the regulatory and uh, scientific development of Ibogaine. In 1986, a, uh, a, sorry, in the first attempt at drug development of Ibogaine was by the Dora Wiener Foundation in 1983. Uh, the foundation was uh, not able to, to raise any significant funding. In 1986, a for-profit corporation, uh, NDA International, was established and subsequently raised $4 million towards the approval of Ibogaine, <coughs> uh, initiating research and patent development. In 1991, the National Institute on Drug Abuse approved, uh, approved their Ibogaine research project. And in 1993, uh, we saw FDA approval for University of Miami clinical studies under a contract to NDA International. Uh, this briefly, and I'll go through very briefly, covers uh, my period of involvement, of uh, uh, commercial involvement with Ibogaine. Uh, the discovery in 62 and 63, in 81 uh, through 96, uh, there was uh, patent development. In 1987, uh, we had the first extractions performed at the Center for National Research in France. The first publication was by Jolin at Erasmus University showing that Ibogaine uh, diminished opioid withdrawal. And then Stanley Glick between 1986 and in fact right through the present time uh, has published possibly uh, three dozen papers on Ibogaine 
and a, an idol being a congener uh, called 18 methoxy coronarity. Between 1988 and 1990, the International Coalition for Addict Self-Help and the Dutch Addict uh, Self-Help Focus Groups, uh, known as DASH, involved themselves in, uh, in uh, uh, providing uh, Ibogaine to uh, Dutch and uh, American and uh, European uh, heroin users. Uh, Patricia Broderick at the City University of New York between 1990 and 1996 involved involved herself with the study of Ibogaine's effects on cocaine, and between 1990 and 1993, NDA International, with cooperation of Professor Dr. Jan Bastians, conducted uh, clinical uh, studies in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Sanchez Ramos and Dr. Mash at the University of Miami between 1991 and 1996 were involved in the FDA study. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, uh, Ibogaine uh, study period was between 1991 and 1996. Uh, between 1994 and 1996, uh, clinical studies moved into hospitals in the Republic of Panama and Panama City. Uh, in, uh, between 1993 and 1996, Dr. Rizvani evaluated Ibogaine's effects on alcohol dependence. And uh, between 1993 and, and 1996, uh, Dr. Popic at the National, National Institute of Health uh, and uh, at the uh, Polish Ministry of Science uh, provided a review and, of Ibogaine and sub-studies uh, concerned with its uh, uh, stimulant nature. In, uh, in, in uh, 1996 and 1997, an Israeli company, uh, Umatech, uh, planned for clinical studies in Israel. Uh, NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, initially rejected ibogaine research. NIDA was petitioned to perform ibogaine research between uh, 84 and 90, first by the Doreen Foundation and later by NDA International, a company established to make ibogaine available as an improved medication. In 91, NIDA formed its Medications Development Division and accepted a product profile review from NDA International that resulted in NIDA starting their Ibogaine research program. The first scientific publication of Ibogaine's anti-addictive effects was by Jolik, uh, who published it in 88 on the effects of uh, Ibogaine diminishing withdrawal in naloxone-precipitated uh, morphine-dependent uh, rats. Uh, NIDA National is on Drug Abuse, which funds 85% of drug addiction research worldwide, uh, responded with uh, a paper from, uh, one of, from uh, their intramural uh, researchers entitled, Ibogaine Fails to Reduce Naloxone Precipitated Withdrawal in Morphine Dependent Rats. Uh, that was answered, this is where we begin to see the politics of science as, this, as they relate to Ibogaine, but politics are evident in science as you are in, in any other human endeavor. Uh, additional research was uh, that supported uh, Jolik's findings uh, were published by Stanley Glick from, the, from Albany Medical College, who evaluated Jolik's work, who evaluated Sharp and Jaffe's work, and provided his own work, and determined that Ibogaine did, in fact, uh, diminish uh, morphine withdrawal in, uh, in morphine-dependent rats. Uh, Jolik then went and demonstrated Ibogaine's effects on cocaine. And as you can see, uh, there is a dose dependence decline in, uh, in, in cocaine self-administration based on uh, single and multiple administrations of Ibogaine. Uh, whereas Vani uh, evaluated Ibogaine's effect on, in the rat on alcohol intake. And there again, you can see a dose dependent response of the diminishment of alcohol intake caused by Ibogaine. Uh, Alper and myself and Frank and Luciano and Bastion uh, did a review article uh, evaluating uh, the, the outcome in patients who were principally treated in, in the Netherlands and Panama uh, for opiate withdrawal. And MASH uh, in uh, 2001 published a heroin study and you can clearly see that this diminishment of opiate withdrawal signs in her uh, patients. Uh, now, there, there, the, many of the, of the subjects who take Ibogaine and describe the effects, one of the effects is returning them to a pre state.
And in terms of the science, what we have to look at is that uh, ibogaine uh, served to decrease induced levels of dopamine activity in drug experienced animals or humans from elevated sensitized levels back to baseline levels. And that's the way scientists describe it in a rat. Human subjects describe it as being returned to a predictive state. Uh, tissue distribution, this is a paper by uh, uh, Howe and, and Glick. And it was very important because there was a question as to what was the nature of ibogaine's long-lasting effects, uh, with MASH proposing that ibogaine's metabolite nor ibogaine was a long-acting drug. But Glick's theory, which I believe holds more relevancy, is that ibogaine is sequestered in the fat, released over time. And the reason that we were seeing noribogaine levels, ibogaine's metabolite, longer out is that when noribogaine is metabolized, it throws a higher plasma levels of than ibogaine and is therefore observable uh, for a greater time out than ibogaine. Uh, NIDA, at this point, uh, contracted with neurotoxicologist Mark Molliver to uh, investigate the neurotoxicity of ibogaine. And uh, Molliver, in this paper, indicated markers which demonstrated at approximately four times the therapeutic dose that there, there appeared to be markers for neurotoxicity. Now, that was responded to by Molinari out of, out of Glitch Group and showed that at 40 milligrams a kilogram, which uh, is a higher dose than would be used in humans, but a good dose in a rat, that there was no neurotoxicity. Molliver then published again, and Molliver, by the way, is a brilliant researcher, published again showing that the, uh, the exact area of uh, neurotoxicity were in Purkinje cells, but I think this matter gets resolved when in 2000, Zhu et al. published on a dose-response study of ibogaine, and what makes this a very interesting study is that was, it was accomplished in part out of the National Toxicological Research Laboratory, which is an FDA laboratory. And uh, it showed no neurotoxicity whatsoever in rats at 25 milligrams a kilogram. Other researchers indicated no evidence of neurotoxicity in a primate in a mouse. And a post-mortem neuropathological study of a woman who was treated with 30 milligrams of ibogaine showed neuro, no neuropathology. There were a number of review papers, all very excellent. This one by Glick, Mechanisms of Action of Anti-Addictive uh, Effects of Ibogaine. Uh, Alper and Kepler and I recently published on a review of the use of ibogaine outside of the African breeding religious context. And if you look at PubMed, which is uh, a uh, public access to the National Medical Database, you can see there are over 280 papers now published on ibogaine majority on ibogaine, ibogaine's effect on narcotic uh, dependence. Uh, ibogaine has multiple mechanisms of action and receptor system effects where drugs of abuse also show activity. These include dopamine, opiates, serotonin, NMDA, nicotinic, GNDF, and signal transduction independent of receptor binding. The objective of the pharmaceutical industry is to return a profit to corporate shareholders. This greatly affects the selection of compounds and indications for drug development and tends to discourage the development of innovative drugs to treat addiction. NIDA has focused on already existing drugs which are then developed for addiction as a new indication and not the development of fundamentally new pharmacological studies such as ibogaine. And this was the first page of an agreement uh, between uh, NIDA and Rickett Benkeser to uh, develop buprenorphine and signed in 1994. In 1995, at the Ibogaine Review Meeting, based principally on the, uh, the uh, statements of industry representatives, uh, NIDA decided not to fund clinical studies of Ibogaine. However, in 2004, based on the possibility of foreign clinical studies, uh, NIDA made available under the Freedom of Information Act a drug master file uh, that had been provided to the FDA consisting of 16 volumes of data of approximately 400,000 pages. And this gives you an idea of some of the studies. There were acute oral toxicity studies, 32 days, uh, do, do, day uh, dose ranging studies, dose response neurotoxicity studies, uh, dose response effects of ibogaine on analgesia and mortality in morphine dependent rats, pharmacokinetic studies, uh, 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 dose-ranging toxicity studies in a dog, 
acute uh, neurotoxicity studies in the dog. Uh, there were uh, what they called uh, an AIMS test, which is a mutagenicity test, and a, a lymphoma, a lymphoma mutagenesis gen genesis, uh, assay, which indicated that ibogaine was not uh, mutagenetic. Now, among the 16 volumes of data, uh, mutagenicity uh, study showing ibogaine not to be a thalidomide uh, drug, and this is the final report from the AIMS test indicating that uh, um, The results of this, of this study uh, uh, indicated that it did not cause positive response with any of the test restraints in the presence or absence of uh, orocolera induced rat liver uh, enzyme. Now, this is okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm I'm going to uh, what we have here is a comparative uh, safety study of ibogaine, indicating that. Uh, between 89 and 2006, there were 11 uh, uh, drug-related fatalities with ibogaine. In 2004, there were 3,965 drug-related fatalities with methanol. And in 1999, there were 112,000 drug-related fatalities from FDA-approved drugs in U.S. hospitals. Ibogaine uh, activist advocacy organizations have played an important role in ibogaine development. Uh, the International Coalition for Addicts Self-Help in 1989 initiated studies in, 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 uh, in, in addicts. Uh, Dutch Addicts Self-Help picked that work up in 1990. Uh, Cures Not Wars supported that work uh, beginning in 1994. And in 2004, an underground movement began in the United States uh, called Freedom Route, which has probably treated uh, approximately 300 uh, heroin and methadone dependent patients. Uh, this was a logo used by iCash to attract attention. It was uh, very effective. Uh, Nico Adrians was one of the founders of both the Rotterdam Junkies Union, Dutch Addicts Self-Help Dash, and the first, also the first established the first needle exchange in 1981. Dash was an ibogaine self-help organization that petitioned the Dutch government and organized drug users to demand ibogaine avail availability. Dash provided ibogaine at no cost to heroin users. Uh, this was a photograph taken during a parade on Fifth Avenue of uh, ibogaine organizing in the United States by uh, ibogaine uh, advocates. And Cures Not Wars uh, uh, petitioned, uh, was very important in uh, petitioning National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, to initially evaluate ibogaine in their studies between 1991 and 1995. Thousands of these leaflets of uh, storm lighter were given out in Washington. And that's the Maryland. Uh, there's a Mindbox internet list, which consists of thousands of users who can uh, discuss their experience with ibogaine. And uh, uh, there are also providers and medical doctors on the list. Uh, this is one of the statements of one of the users. We feel that the conti continuing to focus offshore outside the US has not served the majority of people inside the US, like many other grassroots movements. So, uh, uh, we, we, we want to see this in all major U.S. cities. And uh, Ibogaine represents both harm reduction and demand reduction. And I'm not, I'll go into that at a later point. I'm just running out of time. What is important is Ibogaine's effect on stigma. Uh, stigma is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. For instance, the stigma of chemical dependence. Uh, Ibogaine's effect on stigma. Ibogaine has the ability to remove the stigmatized condition, transforming the patient to a state often described as pre -addictive. The transformation of a stigmatized person into one who is not stigmatized will affect the individual, allowing greater contribution to self and society, improving the quality of life issues. Uh, why Ibogaine is not available, uh, less important than pass to Ibogaine availability. Pharmaceutical companies or government agencies are, are needed uh, to finance regulatory development. Supplies of pharmaceutical grade Ibogaine, this has, has, is now being uh, facilitated. A grassroots constituent, constituency demanding availability, now being facilitated. Political advocacy, slowly coming online. The scientific community supporting Ibogaine, <coughs> has been there. We hope that we will see further and significant research in the future. Okay. Why I believe it should be available, it should be available because it significantly reduces withdrawal, it interrupts drug craving, it returns patients to a pre-addictive state, it eliminates stigma, it returns free choice, and it's in your hands. Thank you.